I'm excited to walk through some scripture with you this morning. Please turn or tap in your Bibles to James chapter 1. We'll be studying James 1, 12 through 15. And uh, I realized this after choosing this verse, but the first part uh, in our passage, I've had hanging on a keychain from my good friend Rick Clark in this great little leather keychain. And in beautifully embossed letters, it reads, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. I guess Rick knew what was coming, though all of us face trials and temptations, don't we? My family and I have been missionaries in Antigua, Guatemala for two years now. Uh, There we've seen God produce growth in the church that we serve at. Uh, We've had the joy of being a part of many short-term mission teams had the privilege to disciple many people, and we serve with some great ministries in our area, Uh, but it has not been easy. There have been many trials, and undoubtedly in the last two years in your lives, you have had trials as well. But we would appreciate your prayers as we've recently left the church that we've been serving at for two years, and we're seeking the Lord for what is next for us in Guatemala. And my wife, Katie, and I would also like to just say thank you so much for all of you who have been praying for us and have reached out. It's meant a lot, and we have felt very loved and supported by this church, which is to say the the people of God who gather here. Let's read the text together. I'll pray, ask God for help, and then we'll walk our way through the passage. So we're in James 1, 12 through 15. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Let's pray. Father, I do just come before you and ask for your help. Uh, I just pray, Father, that you would speak to all of us this morning through your word, whether we've known you for a long time or we don't know you, Father, I just pray for soft hearts and for your truth to come to us this morning, Lord. And I just, I just pray for help because, Lord, I can do nothing without you. And so I just um, pray that I will be uh, just preaching by the power of your Spirit this morning as we're going to talk about living in the Spirit and remaining steadfast, Lord. So please be with us and help us this morning. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, my first morning that we were back here in Spokane, I was going on a run Uh, running southeast down Indian Trail Road. And as I was thinking about how the first part of the book of James connects to our passage, I noticed something. And it's something that's super obvious, but it stood out to me. Uh, There's a a tall retaining wall on my left holding back all of this earth so that they could build sidewalks and a road across where that slope used to go down. And as I looked on the other side of the road, I could just see how that slope would have perfectly connected as it continued down to the other side. Our passage picks up on the other side of the road from where James starts this morning. And as I recite the first four verses, uh, listen for key words from our passage. And we'll see how James is continuing these themes across the road in our passage. So the book of James starts in this way. Uh, James a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now from verse 12 in our passage, blessed is the man, or we could say, or woman, who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. So we see joy when you meet trials in verse 2, gladness or rejoicing 
And blessed in verse 12 can mean happy in the Greek. So there's a sense in which the blessed are those with joy. Then in verse 2, we have trials and testing of faith producing steadfastness. In verse 3, and in our passage in verse 12, the blessed man remains steadfast under trial and then standing the test. It's the same Greek word for trial in both of those places, uh, a putting to the test or temptation to sin, calamity or affliction. And in verse 4, we have letting steadfastness have its full effect to be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Steadfastness leads Christians growing in holiness toward perfection, which will fully come when Jesus returns. Not lacking and complete. This does a good job of what James was getting at with this word perfection in the Greek. And it can also be referring to maturity. Like Ephesians 4.13, we've got a slide there. Until we attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Remaining steadfast under trial produces spiritual maturity, growing in Christ-likeness. And this is something that should bring us joy and count us among the blessed. We see that the steadfast receive a crown of life. God uses trials to test our faith, which shows it to be genuine. And genuine faith will be rewarded when Christ returns. Like 1 Peter 1.7 says, So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So this crown of life is like a reward, and this is speaking of genuine faith resulting in praise and glory and honor for the steadfast Christian, something we're looking forward to. Though the trials, or through the trials, their faith has been purified and refined in a fire. So let's look now at our passage with these connected themes in mind. And here's the passage in my own words in one sentence. Blessed are we who endure trials and temptations that come not from God, but our sinful desires, which bring death. Here's my outline. It has four points. If I was a better preacher, it would have three or maybe five, you know, a more biblical number. But I'm following the text, so we've got four here. Uh, the first one, which I would say is the main idea here, is endure trials and tests. Don't blame God for temptation. Our desires tempt us. And fourth, sin brings death. So endure trials and tests. Happy is the one who remains steadfast under trial. Remaining steadfast. It's not language that we typically use these days, but it talks about persevering or enduring. Blessed is the one who has stood the test. It has later in verse 12. Though tempted or under trial, you are not shaken from your position, but you remain steadfast, firm or unwavering. Not like the man earlier in verse 6 before our passage who asks for wisdom with doubting and not in faith. He is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. And in verse 8, unstable in all his ways. Blessed is the one who through the storms of trials and temptations, though those blow all around them, they hold on tight to their faith. And on the other side, their faith has been strengthened, purified, tested, and judged worthy of a crown of life, a reward. I said trials and temptations is my point because the word trial in verse 12 is closely related to the words we have later as stood the test and tempted. Listen to this in some other translations. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Most other translations use that word trial, but the New Living says, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. And this is good for us to think about because God does test us, 
But as we will see later in our passage, he does not tempt us. Verse 12 goes on, those blessed who hold firm will receive the crown of life. And that's kind of the other word, the other side of this word blessed that we're thinking about. We're happy because we've received favor from God. In the Greek, this word translated as blessed can depict someone with divine favor who is receiving divine favor. God has promised the crown of life to those who love him. Let's, let's dig into what that means, the crown of life. Uh, so in the original language, the word that we have translated in our text as crown signifies more like a prize. And so James wasn't writing about like a royal crown that a king would wear, but more of a garland or a wreath of plants. And this was put on your head to uh, signify that you have just gained a, an award or to show praise in recognition of an achievement. It was a sign of honor and triumph in an event or contest. So what came to my mind were Jesus' words in Matthew 25, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. Uh, listen to the other place in the Bible that mentions this crown of life, Revelation 2.10. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for 10, for 10 days, you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. In this life, you will have trials and temptations, but keep running the race, knowing that a crown of eternal life awaits you at the end. So I was a runner in high school. And I loved the moment when you got to the home stretch, when I could see the finish line. I would kick it into high gear and give it everything I had until I crossed that finish line. And I think that's a little bit of what James is doing for us here. He's pointing our eyes to the prize that we will receive when this life is over when we've crossed the finish line. And with our eyes on that, we can endure to the end. The Bible describes us like a breath in Psalm 144, 4. It says, our days are like a passing shadow. So are you going to spend the few days that you have in this life steadfast under trial? Having this eternal perspective can help us when trials seem long. And it helps us to get our eyes off of ourself, off of our finite lives, with eyes toward eternity. Doesn't this make you want to walk in wisdom, enduring everything thrown at you for the glory of God? Ephesians 5.15 says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So you're seeking to understand God's will. While the world around you is failing miserably at seeking their own will in, attempt, in an attempt to find joy that will last. Follow your heart, they say. That is foolishness. Don't you want to be a witness to the watching world? Trials and temptations crash over you, yet you are able to show that your treasure is not in this world. When people can see this steadfastness in your life, they're going to want that. Okay. I also want to be really careful here uh, because James is not saying that we are uh, putting forth any effort of our own that is earning us eternal life. Think of how James writes later in chapter 2 that faith without works is dead. When a Christian remains steadfast, it shows their faith 
is genuine. We are only saved by grace through faith in Jesus, which is not of our doing, but is a gift of God, not a result of work so that none of us can boast, right? Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. But this, this interesting thing is uh, our, our works will be judged one day, but not to determine our salvation. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 9. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. We will receive rewards for what we have done here. It's wild. Look forward to that. But the judgment seat of Christ, also called the Bema seat, uh, is different from the great white throne of judgment. In Revelation 20, it speaks of all the dead standing before a great white throne and books are opened. These books have the deeds of people written in them and the dead will be judged by what is written in the books according to what they have done. And if these were the only books, we would all face the judgment that we deserve and be sent to hell. However, there is another book that will be opened, which is the book of life. If anyone's name is not found written in the book of life, they will be thrown into the lake of fire. How is your name written in the book of life? Through faith in Jesus. That's the only way. Elsewhere, it's called the Lamb's Book of Life. In Revelation 13 and 21, it has the names of people redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the good news that we call the gospel. We all deserve death because we miss the mark of God's holy perfection. And no amount of good works will earn us salvation. We are called dead in our sin, and a lifeless person can do nothing. That's why God sent His Son to earth as a man in love. And Jesus remained perfectly steadfast under trial, never sinning. Then when He chose to go to the cross as our perfect, spotless, sacrificial lamb. He died in our place, paying for our sins so that we could be counted as righteous. When we repent, turning from our sin to follow Jesus and put our faith in Him, we no longer have a broken relationship with God. And that's how John 17, 3 describes eternal life as knowing the only true God and Jesus Christ whom He sent. And then our names are written in the book of life. Verse 12 says, God has promised a crown of life to those who love Him. We could say one's love for God fuels their steadfastness. A love of God drives Christians to faithfully endure trials and tests on earth. But also there's something important about this phrase, those who love Him. Our love for God shows our steadfastness or faithfulness. And how is that love shown? In our obedience to Him. John 14, 21 says, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Obedience to Christ is an indication of genuine love for Him. Persevering through trials and temptations is a test that shows your faith is genuine, that you are blessed and will receive a crown of life, which sounds like treasure to me. This is another verse that kept coming to my mind, Matthew 6, 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Is your heart with God in heaven, looking toward heavenly treasure? Or does earthly treasure consume you? Are you spending your time remaining steadfast or hoarding for yourself? Look to your treasure in heaven and remain 
steadfast. Those who love God obey Him. What is something that keeps us from obeying God? I would say one of those is temptation. We could say temptations are anything that attempts to lure or entice us away from obeying God. One commentary note said, temptation is an appeal to think or do something contrary to God's law. So let's move on to number two. Don't blame God for temptation. Look at verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Do not blame God for temptation. Uh, we've seen how this, this word temptation is related also to trials and testing. And as we're just thinking about that, we do know from the Bible, God does test his people. Uh, God tested Abraham, asking him to sacrifice his son Isaac in Genesis 22, and then providing a sacrifice. He tested the Israelites with just enough bread from heaven for each day. It says to see if they would walk in his law or not in Exodus 16. But God does not tempt us. There's a distinction there. Verse 13 starts backing up this truth with the fact that God cannot be tempted with evil. God is by His very nature holy. Evil has no sway with God. He is not vulnerable to it. But we have a different nature. And our sin nature wars within us with desires tempting us. But God tempts no one. One thing maybe some of you have thought of, and I thought of the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus is instructing on how to pray. In Matthew 6.13 is in one place, and He said, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So there's the sense where we are asking God not to lead us into temptation. But listen to Jesus, to the disciples going to the Garden of Gethsemane before He knew He would be crucified. He said, pray that you may not enter into temptation in Luke 22, 40. The word temptation in the Lord's Prayer can also refer to trials or testing. They're closely related. So I found in the New Living Translation, it says, don't let us yield to temptation. And there's also a note that says it could be, and keep us from being tempted. We could think of this as a way to pray, God, please spare us from difficulties or circumstances that would tempt us to sin. I remember many of us praying this way during COVID, please let this pass, Lord. Like we so despise and fear sin that we want to escape all ways of falling into it, choosing to avoid rather than having to defeat temptation. I think Jesus is teaching us to pray with a heart that desires to avoid the danger and the trouble sin creates. Think of Christ's prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane before going to the cross. My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Father, if it is possible, let this trial or temptation pass from me. But Jesus was sinless. So I think we should pray with a humility, knowing our tendency towards sin and how we may react under trial. We should not take sin lightly. We should see it as dangerous and to be avoided. We don't want to become callous toward it or give ourselves up to it. We don't want to presume that we can avoid temptation and get through trials sinless on our own without God. Until we are with the Lord, there is always a danger of temptation to sin and trials which result in sin. One commentator wrote of us praying the Lord's Prayer, admitting our need for the protection and deliverance of our loving Heavenly Father when we pray, lead us not into temptation. The stress is on our vulnerability and therefore dependence on God for avoiding sin. Jesus prayed this a second time, My Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. But we can ask for deliverance from testing 
and strength to endure it if we must remain steadfast while we pass through it. But it is not God who tempts us. This brings us to our third point. Our desires tempt us. Look at verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Some other translations say carried away and enticed by his own lust or enticed by his own evil desire. So think of your evil desires just dragging you off to death. This is the imagery. And this is why Paul wrote so strongly about them, of putting them to death. Look at Colossians 3, 5 and 6. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Jesus spoke of this in Mark 7. He said that it is from within the heart of man that these evil things come and defile a person. They may promise you pleasure and goodness, but they lead to death. Like a big, fat, juicy worm dangling in front of a fish on a hook. That fish doesn't know that behind that worm is a sharp, deadly hook. And in the end, the fish is actually the one who is caught up and devoured and dragged away to death. That's the kind of language James is uh, using when he was thinking of lured and enticed, fishing and hunting, baiting an animal to their death. So we are tempted by our own evil desires. And what comes of this? This brings us to our final point, number four, sin brings death. Read verse 15 with me. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. I found it really interesting that James is using uh, the natural way in which we bring forth life to talk about sin bringing forth death. He uses the example of desire conceiving or becoming pregnant. Then desire gives birth to sin. You could say desire is child is sin. And when the sin grows up, it has a kid named death. Desire has a kid named sin who brings forth a grandchild named death. It's a string of consequences. Desire, sin, death. And giving into temptation starts this process. We can see it in what we call the fall back in Genesis 3, when sin was first brought into the world by humans. Eve saw that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, which God had told her not to eat from, was to be desired to make one wise. Desired. There's the desire contrary to God's will. Then she took the fruit and ate it with her husband Adam. There's the sin. And what did God say would happen to them if they ate of that tree? You shall surely die. There's the death. And while they didn't immediately die, they were kicked out of the garden where they were eating from the tree of life. And also their sin brought them spiritual death or a separation from God. Their relationship with the source of life was broken and they did eventually die. Their desire led to sin which brought forth death. So what should we do about this? How do we put to death the deeds of the body that come when we are lured and enticed by our desires? By the Spirit. Romans 8.13 For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, you, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So we use spiritual weapons like prayer to fight against our desires. If you are a Christian, you are a son or daughter of God. And Romans 8.14 says, All who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Galatians 5.16, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit means living by the Spirit. 
the way you live, the choices you make, and the decisions that are made are made asking the Holy Spirit to guide you, not letting your desires guide you. The way to defeat the desires of the flesh is to yield to the Spirit, to stop relying on your flesh, and you live your life in the power of the Holy Spirit. Many of us might not think that much about the Holy Spirit, but Jesus called Him the Helper. Look at John 14, 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And I really like this because one of the ways that we can fight temptation is with God's Word, by memorizing Scripture and remembering it in trials and in temptations. By doing this, we can fight in the Spirit. Jesus Himself was tempted by Satan, and we don't have time to get into it, but other than our desires, Satan is the other way that we are tempted. But what did Jesus do when He was tempted by Satan? He fought by the Spirit using the sword of the Spirit. Ephesians 6, 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Personally, I have found two verses very helpful over the years to help me fight in times of trials and temptations to renew my mind and to remind me of who I am in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. In Galatians 2.20, I got these both from the Navigators. Great Bible verses to memorize, by the way. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I now live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. Blessed are we who endure trials and temptations that come not from God, but our sinful desires, which bring death. And we are saved from spiritual death by Christ alone. Those who remain steadfast under trial will receive the crown of life with which God has promised to those who love Him. We remain firm in our faith through trials that test us. We persevere and fight our desires because there is one who loved us so much that He sent His Son to die for us. We love because He first loved us, 1 John 4.19 Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. John 14, 21. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. Let these truths penetrate your heart and build up your faith that you may remain steadfast under trial. Let's pray. Ah, Father, we are so thankful for your word. We're so thankful, Father, that you are a God who has said that you will always be with us. And you've given us your Holy Spirit to remind us of your words of truth that can build us up and remind us, Lord, we need to be reminded of who we are in you so often as we go through trials, and to be reminded that through these temptations and times of suffering and times of trial that we are not alone. We have a firm foundation in Jesus Christ who goes before us. Lord, just pray that you would help us to lean on you in all that we do. Lord, please help us to uh, remain steadfast under trial and to look to you when we are struggling and suffering, Lord, not trying to do it in our own strength, but depending on you, Father, depending on Jesus. All authority, was, all authority was given to him, Lord. He is above all, and he is the best example for us in all things. So, Lord, I just pray you would help all of us to be more like your son, Jesus, and to grow in godliness 
to be refined. And we just thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the forgiveness purchased by the blood of Jesus so that we can be set free to have a repaired relationship with you so that we may come and sing together, encouraging each other's hearts and worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.